if you think about it, southern Spain, Andalusia, sun all the time. Do you think the potential they've got? Potential energy, yeah, but the practically turning sunshine into useful work is phenomenally difficult. Yeah, but we're up for a challenge. Culturally vibrant, Andalusia was once one of the poorest parts of Spain. But sunshine is one thing that it's always had in abundance. The Spanish call this region the frying pan, and Dick and Jem are beginning to realize why. It's more like the double oven of Spain, though, because it's blasting in from the top and then welling up from underneath. Spain is determined to use this natural resource and become a world leader in solar technology. And now Dick and Jem have caused some fever. They want to use it to help green up this traditional thinker. I think we've reached the homestead. I'm quite jealous of the guy already. He's got a castle. The planet mechanics have been called in by farm owner and solar pioneer Jesus Martinez. Hello. Hello. Nice, nice to meet you down here. Nice Hello, I'm Nice to meet you. Yeah. Come with us. Show you all the things you know. Jesus's idyllic 500 hectare finca certainly looks like a conventional Andalusian ranch, but there is nothing old fashioned about his plans for the future. Jesus has set aside waste ground on the edge of the finca to produce the one crop this part of Spain is crying out for clean, renewable energy. And this is how he'll do it. His solar farm will look like this. 34,000 solar panels producing 3 gigawatts of electricity. The Spanish government subsidizes green energy, so the local power company should be keen to buy Jesus's solar power. It will be used to meet the power demands of tourist developments mushrooming along this coast. But first, Jesus is keen to sort out a problem much closer to home. Hey. And that's why he's called in the planet mechanics. Do these horses speak English? <laughs> Hey girls, how are you doing? Jesus is understandably proud of his herd of beef cattle, but supplying 100 thirsty cows with drinking water is giving him an environmental headache. They drink a lot, something like 50 liters a day, every cow. Water is not the problem, the problem is the pumping. Okay. If we've got a well to see, that'd be great, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah that'd, be, that'd be nice, yeah. because I don't know how long my bottom will last. <laughs> That's right. The cattle are happy with the water. But how they get it, that's the problem. Hey, Antonio, how are you doing? Antonio. I'm Dick. Running the pump operation is the job of Jesus' all-round right-hand man, Antonio. Antonio is our local John Wayne. Okay. <laughs> Antonio draws drinking water using an antiquated fume-belching diesel pump. It's not exactly environmentally friendly, and Jesus wants rid of it. It's smelly, it's old, it's dirty, it's a diesel. That's not far off being a fire pump. That running for an hour is an awful lot of water. I mean, that's a big thing to replace. Trying to do that with green energy is a challenge. From that distance, that much water is hard. It's not that we're shy of a challenge, but uh, that's a big job. Jem is looking crushed. But Colonel Dick is not ready to run up the white flag just yet. He's thinking, Plan B. Is this your only well that's working? Well, we have a small well, but there is a, nothing is not working at the moment, no pump. Can we yeah. see it? Why not? Yes, let's go. So it's back in the saddle for another bone-shaking trip across the parched Finca. This, this looks small much well. more like the kind of well I imagined. <laughs> All hopes are riding on the abandoned smaller well. Why is this not in use? Because, uh, well, we have no cows here because there is no pumping motor. So if you could pump the water out of here, uh -huh, uh -huh. you could have cows in this field. That's right. <laughs> Why well, don't you do that? Everyone agrees the small well seems to be perfect. Now Dick and Jem have to work out the not-so-minor detail of how to pump water in an environmentally friendly manner. They could use photovoltaic solar panels. But Dick and Jem didn't travel all this way to come up with such an obvious solution. So photovoltaics, you know, it's old hat. Uh, Jesus knows about it. Jesus said that he's going to 
have a whole field full of solar panels. I think he would be very disappointed if we came back to him and suggested that he put a so another solar panel there. So that, that's not got any innovation to it. OK, something else. Well, there is a concept out there called the Stirling engine, and it does just run on hot air. So all you would need, in principle, is sunshine making hot air, and that would do everything. The key principle of the Stirling engine is that a fixed amount of gas is sealed inside a chamber within the machine. This gas is alternately exposed to heat and cold, causing it to expand and then contract. A mobile displacer controls the alternating cycle of expansion and contraction, which is used to drive the engine. The energy is used to power machinery. In Jem's case, a pump to draw water out of the well. You get Stirling engines in top of the range nuclear submarines. In theory, a Stirling engine can be an extremely quiet, efficient way of converting heat into movement. And if that heat is provided by sunshine, they can be pollution free too. But complex Stirling engines are expensive to build, usually requiring the resources of high spec organizations such as NASA or the military. We're in a Finca. In the middle of nowhere with a horse box, we've got a couple of days. Do you really think we can do that? Maybe we can take the principles of the Stirling engine and make it in a more simple way. Do you not think Hazus would absolutely go wild for it, though? He would then have an incredibly interesting piece of kit that literally no other thinker in Spain would have even thought of, if you know what I mean. <laughs> But down-to-earth Dick is seriously worried about Jem's flight of fancy. We need a backup. Yeah, normally, Dick, I'm not in favour of a safety net, but I think on this occasion, we've pushed the boat so far out with the Stirling engine, we can't even see the shore. Jesus said this is the windiest part of Spain. Let's use the wind. Something simple. A wind pump? To get the water pumping, Dick is proposing to build a traditional windmill. A windmill is powered by a set of rotating blades. The energy created by the spinning blades causes a shaft to rotate and move a crank up and down. The crank is connected to a piston pump that will pull water up from the well. The technology may be straightforward, but building a windmill is an enormous challenge. And Dick will still need plenty of sunshine. We are still using sunshine, because it's the sunshine in Africa that generates the heat that makes the wind blow over Jesus' finger. <laughs> I'm using a Spanish sunshine and you're using exotic African sunshine. The time for talking is through. It's high noon at the Finca. Colonel Dick will need to bring out his heaviest guns to manufacture a traditional windmill in just a few short days. But young dude Jem thinks he will be the first to the draw with his newfangled hot air Stirling engine. The planet mechanics have come up with radically different ways of pumping water from a well. But first, they must team up. Swing it in there. Ooh. <laughs> and get their Eco Workshop horse box up and running and ready for business. With the relentless Andalusian sun belting down, our planet mechanics are positioning their truck in some much needed shade. I mean, I'm thinking, because of the heat, shade's going to be more important to us. I think we'll forget about the wind power and just make sure the solar panel's given us as much as possible. Yeah. Good man. Manufacturing a Stirling engine and a windmill is going to be a Herculean task. They've got a truck full of tools, as many raw materials as they could transport, and all of their own engineering wit and ingenuity. Everything else will have to be scavenged locally. Jem's come down to earth with a bump. He's finally beginning to realize the enormity of the challenge he set himself. Sterling engines are usually built in high-tech laboratories. He's got to make one out of the back of a truck. Dick's also got a mechanical mountain to climb. He's got a few short days to manufacture a high-spinning windmill. He spotted a batch of old barrels and he thinks he can recycle them to produce a set of blades. It's a smart move. The steel is tough, lightweight 
and the concave shape means the blades can capture wind much more efficiently, giving his windmill a better chance of getting moving. A big bonus for Dick is that he won't need to spend time building a tall tower for his windmill. The well is situated on a wide open plain, which receives the full force of the Levanta, the strong wind that blows in from North Africa. Out here, a low-rise windmill should catch lots of unobstructed wind. To be out of the cattle's way, the spinning blades will have to be short. Short blades catch less wind, so Dick will need more of them. But more blades will create drag, which limits top speed. But Dick doesn't care about speed. He knows more blades also means more torque or twisting force. That rotary force will then be converted to drive a piston pump up and down, drawing water from the well. Dick has rustled up an extremely strong disc that he wants to use as the spinning hub at the heart of his windmill. Now he's got his hub, he can work out how many blades he can use. The more he can fit, the more power he will get. When the blades are attached, their spinning motion will turn the shaft mounted in a pair of bearings. Blades on here, center somewhere about there, goes around, water pumps. Nice. It makes you wonder why I'm going to take so long to finish it. <laughs> Dick may sound confident, but he's got a very long way to go before his windmill can draw in the cows. But at least he's happily getting his hands dirty. Jem's Sterling engine is still stuck at the R&D stage. To cheer himself up, he's got hold of a desktop Sterling engine to demonstrate the principles of his amazing hot air machine. It'll work off the heat from a cup of tea. But even then, it doesn't quite start itself. So there we go. So the, the heat from your tea mm -hmm. keeps this plate hot mm -hmm. and this, the air keeps this plate cool. Mm -hmm. And right. the little insulating piston inside moves the air from the hot side to the cold side. And in doing that, the air expands and contracts. When the hot air gets to the top of the cylinder, it rapidly cools and contracts, forcing the displacing piston down. This continuous cycle of expansion and contraction drives a second smaller piston, which provides mechanical power to turn the wheel. So I figure if I'm going to make you a Stirling engine that has any chance of pumping water, it's going to need to be thousands of times bigger than this. But Jem is still desperately trying to work out just how he's going to manufacture his version of a Stirling engine. He's persuaded Dick that what they both need is to get away from it all and seek out some much needed solar inspiration. After a two hour drive, they get their first glimpse of one of the most staggering sights in southern Spain. Europe's first commercially run solar power station. That's like nothing I've ever seen before. It makes our trip feel more like a pilgrimage. Do you know what I think? It's got that sense that there should be music just striking up from the heavens. It's impressive. We've got to go and get a closer look. The solar tower situated just outside of Seville is a futuristic vision of how energy could be generated throughout the world's sunniest regions. It appears to me as though somehow some massive science fiction nut landed the job as Spanish Minister for Electricity. <laughs> but ground level, the scale of this operation is mind-blowing. But in practice, how it works is amazingly simple. We've got mirrors shining up, getting something nice and hot up there and making electricity. A giant field of steel reflectors, or heliostats, surround a central 115-metre-tall concrete tower. The rows of heliostats steadily rotate to track the path of the sun. Throughout the day, they capture and reflect sunlight towards the top of the 40-storey tower. The intense light is concentrated on a heat exchanger, which converts solar energy into steam. This steam is blasted into turbines generating 11 megawatts of electrical power, all without a single puff of greenhouse gas. Keeping the sunshine reflected off these must be a mammoth job. We're keeping them all polished. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a job I'd fancy. Right. Hey. To find out about the running of the plant, Dick and Jem caught up with the operations manager, Mr. Carroll. That is impressive. It's quite simple. It's like a giant steam engine 
with many mirrors pointing at it. Sure. It's a very simple concept, but uh, it requires a very accurate design and control to fit every piece together and to make it run uh, in a very commercial way. This is the first solar tower working in a commercial operation in the world and producing what, uh, the electricity that it is expected from it. That's amazing! It's like Greek technology, Victorian steam technology and cutting-edge electricity. In all the areas where it's too hot to grow anything, you can just farm sunshine. Sure. But this particular solar farm is expanding fast. A second solar tower will soon come on stream and eventually this plant should produce enough energy to power Spain's fourth biggest city, Seville. And this plant is keen to branch out and develop other methods of solar energy generation. These futuristic structures may look very different from GEM's desktop model, but they are in fact Stirling engines. Jem is obviously keen to get a closer look. But the presence of the maintenance crew is only fueling Dick's scepticism about the Sterling engine's reliability. Oh, I yeah. feel the sun off there. But the thing looks like it's just insulation held together with tape. There's not an awful lot of precision looking up there. I bet inside that, there will be a frightening level of precision. Because it's not working. I think when you're pushing the frontiers of science, you can't expect things just to fall into place. Oh, he seems to really enjoy that. Hey, Susan, I'm pushing the frontiers of uh, science. My cows are thirsty, but yeah, hey. I, I think that's why we're using the, the uh, ancient technology of the windmill as a backup system. And that's a timely reminder to Dick. His windmill is still a very long way from spinning. As for Jem, he still has to prove that all his talk about Stirling engines is not just a lot of hot air. Back at the ranch, Jem's first task is to construct an airtight chamber. To get the engine moving, one side must be hot, the other side cold. We're going to need thick aluminium for the cold side. On the hot side, it's effectively like a greenhouse. I thought we'd go for, like, a tough plastic. How do you say that in Spanish? I know the numbers one to three and hola. <laughs> I can say beer. <laughs> I'll come out with you tonight, then, Dick. OK. Jem's finally got a plan, and he's wasting no time putting it into action. The sun shines through a transparent plastic cover onto a black painted displacer. The heat warms the trapped air. On the other side of the machine, an aluminium plate chilled by running water cools the air. Air expands in the hot side and contracts in the cold side in a continuous cycle. This movement should give him enough power to pump water. Jem's getting to grips with that large sheet of aluminium, which will make up the cold side of the box. Aluminium is an excellent conductor. When this metal is exposed to cold water, the temperature of the air in this side of the chamber should drop rapidly. The water's going to come in at this end here, yep. run down it, and then we should get plenty of cooling. Yep. The, the sort of factor that gives us the power at the engine is the temperature difference. Yeah. So the colder we can get the cold side and the hotter we can get the hot side, the better it's going to be. So every degree counts. It really does. <laughs> every degree counts. Dick gets back to the massive task of bashing out his windmill blades. Windmills have been used to drive pumps for centuries. But by using recycled materials to build his, Dick's putting a new spin on a tried and tested method. The curved shape will ensure the blades catch the wind, but they need to be set at an angle to increase efficiency. We need our blades at 45 degrees, so it starts with less wind. And I guess you do want them all the same, otherwise the thing's going to be rattling around a bit. Yeah, we have to get them all the same. The windmill blades are angled. The skill here is to angle them steeply enough for the windmill to start easily, but not so steeply that they become inefficient or unstable when they turn quickly. <laughs> okay. 
Jem is keen to get going on stage two of assembling his Stirling engine. He needs to come up with his version of the blue displacing piston, which controls the movement of air between the hot and cold side of the airtight cylinder. Jem is making his displacing piston from a sheet of insulation foam. It's lightweight, but stiff and strong enough for the job. Inside the box, yep. that's going to be flipping either side. But that is impressive, that's big. Yeah. Good. He's painting one side of the displacer piston black. This will help to absorb the maximum amount of heat from the sun. The higher he can get the temperature on the hot side, the more efficient and hopefully more powerful the engine will be. Dick's been up since sunrise, and he's almost finished fitting together a 16-blade rotor. It's critical that these blades are equally spaced and correctly aligned, as an out-of-balance windmill could vibrate, making it unstable and dangerous. Yeah, mate. Can you use the lift across with this, could you? It's all quite sharp, and it's all quite heavy. If a blade shears off, it could destroy the whole windmill and cause carnage amongst the cattle. That's quite nice, isn't it? It's kind of beautiful. Yeah. My next challenge is I've got to turn the round about, you know, the spinning motion into an up and down. Sorry, I was hypnotised when you said that. What, what, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you could end it with hypnotised cows. I think we're just about out of solar energy here, you know. You mean our machines are going to die fairly soon? No, I actually mean I need to go to the beach and have a beer. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and after a quick beer at the beach, there's one more treat in store. Jesus has invited the guys back for some home-cooked paella. Oh, good on oh, Gracias. Wow. Thank you very much. Buen appetit. This should be time out. But the planet mechanics are always on standby for their next ecological challenge. It's a fine-looking pan of paella, but it's what's keeping it hot that has given Jem food for thought. Uh, how long does it take to cook paella? Only one hour. Only one hour? Yes. And do you have it on a high heat or a low heat? At first, high heat, and then only slow heat. Only yes. slow? Yes, because the rice is... No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Do you think it would be possible to cook paella from the power of the sun, from of sunshine? Course. Yeah. Of course, yes. Yes? Yes. They're still trying to finish off not just one, but two naturally powered pumps to draw water from deep under the Spanish ground. And now they've accepted the challenge of cooking a huge paella using nothing but the power of the sun. It's 7 a.m. and things are already hotting up at the Finca. Jem's reached a crucial stage of constructing the Stirling engine. On the miniature Stirling engine, the rapid expansion and contraction of the air inside moves the power piston. It's this which delivers the power to turn the flywheel. Jem's planning to fit his power piston to the hot side of the box. Once they're up and running, Stirling engines are renowned for their smooth, continuous motion. NASA wants a solar engine to power a deep space probe. However, it's unlikely their model will be made in a truck. Oh, okay, it's getting warm already, mate, and we're in the shade. With the power piston completed, Jem can finally snap together his big box of tricks. <laughs> Colonel Dick's been transferred from windmill duties. It's time for his next masterclass in Stirling engine physics. <laughs> How much energy is this going to make? Hopefully, almost as much energy as it takes to lift it. That's the piston that's going to be moving the flipper. So that's what times hot, cold, hot, cold. And then over here, now. Show me the power then. Dick, as machines go, this is the mechanical equivalent of rubbing your stomach and patting your head. OK, so when the flipper inside is at the, at, the, at the aluminium end, then the sun streams through, the air gets the entire heat of the sun, 
gets hot, expands, and then pushes that out. Look at that power! That works the pump. Dig looks impressed. But with a field full of thirsty cows to water and a whole town hungry for solar paella, he's keen to finish his windmill. Dick, have you got up and down motion there? We have indeed, spin this. Go on, look, it's going around. Okay, this is turning, a little cam makes it go up and down, simple, but down, this is the important bit, down through the centre of the whole mass system, we're going to have a rod pushing onto the pump, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling, which is going to pull the water up for us. So every time it goes down, collect some water, lifts it, down, lifts it, down, lifts it. As the blades spin, a crankshaft steadily rotates, powering a long rod in a steady up and down motion. This rod is contained in a long pipe and connected to a water piston pump. When the rod rises, water enters the pipe through a valve at the bottom. When the piston drops, the trapped water forces down and closes the valve. This water is then forced up through a second valve, through the piston and up into the pipe. As long as Dick's blades keep spinning, a steady flow of water will be pumped up from the well. Like the rest of the windmill, the pump is unashamedly low-tech, but remarkably effective. Yeah. <laughs> it's D-Day for Gem's Sterling engine, and it's set up for its trial run. The transparent front is collecting heat directly from the sun and getting a boost of extra sunshine from the reflector. The cold aluminium back is doused down with water for extra cooling. With no internal combustion, Stirling engines have a reputation for quiet efficiency. But they're also notoriously difficult to get going. It doesn't quite start itself. So there we go. To help to start and maintain his engine's timing, Jem has connected it to a large U-shaped water pipe. He's hoping it'll act like a liquid pendulum. Jem needs to get the displacer moving between the hot and cold side of the engine. He hopes to start this movement by sloshing the water back and forth in the U-shaped pipe. The water acts like a pendulum, creating pressure variations which push and pull on the piston that drives the displacer. OK, we want to get it started. We put a plunger in. Yeah, give it a go. Going to start going in Dick's on plunge duty. He made it. Here we go. <laughs> Don't put me under pressure. Here we go, here, one plunge. He provides the pressure kickstart to get the engine going. Yes! Well, that's working. It's not very fast, but the piston is actually moving. As the pressure increases in there, the power piston starts working. But there's a problem with that big flipping displacer. Now, the flipper inside moves a tiny amount, but I think that should be moving. It should be, but I think what it is, is when we filled this with water, it squeezed all the air up in here. This is now under pressure inside. And I think Excess pressure means the piston that's supposed to act on the displacer isn't working. It's sticking against the cold side, stopping it moving. I think to get round the problem of there being excess pressure in there, we should buzz a little hole in here, release some of the air, and then seal it back up again. So Jem drills a small hole to release some of the pressure. And just as pressure is being released from the box, the pressure for the Planet Mechanics mount, Jesus drops by. Do you want to start the engine? We'll prime it up, here we go. It's a tense moment. Pressure is being released from the box, but will it be enough to get the engine going? Now watch the power piston here. This is where the power comes out. It's only a small amount of power. The piston starts to move, and Jesus seems impressed. That's right, it's like a hard bit in this. Yeah. It's pretty nice. And it goes by itself. We have the smallest amount of action out of our Stirling <laughs> engine. Jem has finally managed to breathe life into his big box. <laughs> but without weeks of intensive surgery, this Stirling engine will remain on the critical list. I will be completely honest with you, Hazers. Mm -hmm. It's sort of late afternoon sun now, even in the middle of the day, in the middle of June, this is never going to pump water out of your well.
It's collecting heat and cooling, but the temperature difference between the two sides is too small. GEM's engine is just too inefficient to turn heat into power. It shows that Stirling engines do work, it just also shows they're nearly impossible. But GEM shouldn't feel too downhearted. He's built a fantastically complex engine in a matter of days, using the most basic of materials. It's been a sterling achievement. As for the cows, all hopes now rest with Dick and his homemade windmill. So it's back to work, and Dick gets down to finishing off the frame that will hold his big set of blades. Next, a tail fin, which will keep the rotors facing straight into the breeze to pick up maximum wind force. So for Dick, everything has finally come together. It's time to take his windmill out for a spin. The recycled rotor is an impressive sight, but Dick better hope that all those sharp blades are firmly bolted down in place. Looks like a wind pump to me. <laughs> uh, Antonio, uh, vamos. I think I told him the right hold thing. Hold on, hold on, mate. We could go backwards. After all that hot, hard work, the guys can sit back and enjoy the ride. A rating the window should be a breeze. Fine day for it. But there could be a problem. Okay, nice and close. The well is situated in the most exposed part of the Finca. The Levanta wind has been steadily rising throughout the afternoon. And that could spell trouble. Let's see if it lines, lines up, okay? Hold on. Perfect, bring it down. Dick, it's too so windy. It's not, I don't even like that up there. Can you imagine doing that with a six foot diameter um, kite on the end of it with razor blades attached? Well, that's what it is. It's just nothing but sharp metal. It's yet another blow for the wind battered mechanics. Viento flojo mañana. Absolutely. Okay. Mañana. It's a word that Dick doesn't need translated. The only hope is that the storm blows itself out by tomorrow. But there's no question of simply sitting it out. Jem has to find a way of cooking a large pan of paella at tomorrow's town festival. That trip to the solar tower has got Jem thinking. Here, the banks of reflectors rotate to track the sun and concentrate all that energy onto one small area. If Jem can find a way of reflecting enough sunlight onto the paella, he stands a good chance of cooking it thoroughly without poisoning the festival goers. It's not taken Jem long to rustle up an experimental prototype. Dick, what are you doing, mate? I've got a long powered death ray. It's amazing. <laughs> Suck the air out of here, it then pulls that into a curve. That curve then focuses the sunlight on anything and you can fry it. I don't believe it. Check this, right? When Jem sucks the air out of the big bowl, the reflective cover is pulled into a curve. This means that all of the sunshine hitting it is reflected into one super powerful focus point. Whoa! Which, like he says, enables him to fry anything. It's ace. Whoa. Paper, cardboard, and even clothing. We could dry my sweaty socks. Be very careful with that, Dick. <laughs> Oh, it's drying nicely. That's not drying, that's catching fire. <laughs> Bit of damage, mate. Clearly, Jem's solar cooker <laughs> is still a work in progress. It's the final day at the Finca. And the planet mechanics have one last chance to draw water from Hazus' well. It feels quite nice now. It's not so bad. Yes, that's it, it's better, yeah. Oh, that's not too bad. That ferocious wind has died down overnight. Conditions are perfect for windmill erection. Dick and Jem lose no time preparing the ground for the big lift. It's a heavy job, and they've called in Antonio. We're now going to lift some heavy weights. Venga, vamos a montar. Yeah, he doesn't understand, <laughs> but he can do the hard bits. Dick is keen to delegate the hard work. But Antonio seems to have other ideas. 
As Dick and Jem struggle with the heavy rotor, he's put himself on lightweight pole duty. But this job is crucial. That pole is stopping the blades spinning out of control at this vital moment. Oh. Right, get up there and hold that up there so it doesn't come forward again. Jem secures the rotor while Dick bangs in the final bolt. Okay. It's in place. Now it's on to fitting the pump. <laughs> you ready? It's going to go in the water now. Yes. Now that gets fed down through the end. Yeah. Everything is finally in place for the big switch on, and Jesus has arrived bang on time. As soon as Jim cuts uh -huh. the safety connections off, yeah, and I pull this piece of wood out, it starts uh -huh. to turn and pump water. No, it just sounds great. <laughs> it's the last one done. I'm so pleased we're doing this today, not yesterday. If you want to go over there and watch the end of that pipe... OK, that's a good idea. Jesus, here we go. This is it's yours. You. Thank you very much. Look at this, here we go. Come in. It's going in and out. Yeah, look, it's water coming at the top. Yes, We've got a head of pressure. Yeah! Yay! Yeah! 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 Oh, look at Dick that. Jim, hey, Antonio, Dick and Jen. Antonio, this is great. This is great. Like the that. first water by windmill here in the Finca. It's a brilliant success. The old dry trough can now receive a steadily pumped supply of environmentally sourced drinking water. That's faster than a cow can drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I see it. And the cattle have soon sniffed out the new supply of water. For Dick and Jem, it's a job well done. But there's no time to relax. They have paella to cook. Back at the Finca, Jem is refining his plans to produce a solar cooker to set up at the local Fiesta. Inspired by the rows of giant heliostats used at the solar power station, he's experimenting with a variety of ways of reflecting sunlight. Now he's come up with his latest prototype. He's bashed out some shiny metal and is very excited about the reflective properties of the curve. I've made a small one out of our dustbin. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> this curve should focus all the sunshine in this area into a tiny spot along here. You can see the way it hits my hand. Okay. So try that on there. You know, with our death ray, yeah. that you couldn't put your hand there. Yeah. It totally cooked it. But this one doesn't focus it to a point. It focuses it to a line. So I think we're need, going to need to go much bigger. We want a big trough full of paella. So this is the right shape for us. Oh, so we can't spear paella onto a stick. <laughs> I think it's achievable. I think we just need to go bigger and bigger and bigger. Jem needs to carefully shape the metal curve to form a parabola. A parabolic curve reflects all the light that hits it to one specific area called the focus point. The trough must be positioned along this line of focus. The reflected sunlight should then heat the bottom of the trough and cook the paella. For the plan to work, Jem's got to get his parabolic curve spot on. If he gets his sums wrong, the Planet Mechanics could be eating humble pie. Meanwhile, Dick's determined to do his bit to ensure that all goes well at the festival. This is really high speed. The thing about this is, you get to see more of the countryside when you go slowly. Well, there's a snail, which is overtaking. He's asked Jesus to steer him towards the best sherry cellar in town. Wow! How many barrels have we got here? Ahí uno, 1,200 bottles. 1,200. And one. <laughs> and one. <laughs> and one. <laughs> oh, whoa! This bodega has been producing fino, a type of sherry for well over 200 years. In Andalusia, sherry is taken very seriously, and a feria without fino is unthinkable. It's really the heart of the feria. <laughs> you can imagine a feria without. <laughs> Picking a blend is a tricky business, but Dick seems to be relishing the challenge. Yes. <laughs> Are you seeing this? Mm. Is <laughs> the old what Jem's doing? He's probably working very hard, bless him. Oh, poor guy, we can take a barrel for him now. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, we'll just drink his share. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Across town, preparations for tonight's ferrier are now in full swing. 
But the busiest man on the site is planet mechanic Jem, desperately trying to build a large-scale solar paella trough. It's a race against time, and Jem's feeling the heat. In a few hours, the ferrier will be in full swing. And curious onlookers are intrigued at just what that dirty-faced Englishman is up to. While Jem bashes metal, sous chef Dick goes into overdrive with the chopping knife. Thankfully, Inma has arrived to give the British ex-colonel some tips on how to feed an army of Spanish festival goers. How difficult do you think it will be cooking with a solar trough compared to a cooker? And... I think only the difficult is the time. Jem has finished his parabolic reflector. It's an impressive piece of kit, but can it really cook paella? It's time to bring in the key components of the cooker. It's bright, clean and shiny, but it's unlikely the locals have ever eaten paella out of a trough. To squeeze every degree of heat from the reflected sunlight, Jem's giving his grill an extra boost, a coat of black paint. Solar cooking is seen as the way forward in many developing countries. It would save billions of hours spent gathering fuel, preserve forests and help save the planet. How long do you think it'll take the sun to cook this? I think two hours. Two hours? Yes. Okay. <laughs> For the Hurry up! Dick and Jem hope Inma is right. It's taken so long to manufacture the cooker that it's now well past the hottest part of the day. Getting all this food to cook in time is now a serious worry. But Jem's finally finished the trough. The reflector is ready. It's all systems go for the big solar switch on. Should we give it some sun? All right. They're unveiling. It's going to start getting hot now. Whoa, hey! There we go. Is this hot? It's very hot. Jim, mate, you keep it in the sun. I'll start chucking the ingredients in. That's the deal, Dick. I'm going to make myself up a sun stick. Amazingly, the trough has reached high temperature within seconds. It's time to get cooking. Jem has made a huge wooden frame with calibrated notches. This will allow him to constantly maneuver the cooker so it can track the steady movement of the sun. Now the maximum amount of power is blasted up at the trough. Chef Dick is delighted with the results. Never mind the Spanish music. Listen to this, are you ready? Sizzling! It's a solar sizzle! Yes! <laughs> but if you think your solar sizzling is good, check my focusing. Look there. <laughs> my focus stick, it casts no shadow. Wow, that's impressive. So you're just going to keep that pointing all the time? I've got to keep lifting it as the sun moves and keep rotating it as the sun moves. And so long as that's casting no shadow, I know I'm pointing exactly at the sun. You give me heat, I'll give you paella. OK, good deal. With the oil and vegetables starting to cook, Dick adds the rest of the mix. But as the amount of food builds up, the sun starts to go down. As the food gently simmers, Jem battles to get maximum sunlight onto that trough. He not only needs to notch up the reflector, he must manoeuvre the whole cooker in a desperate chase for the last of the sunlight. This isn't away well. Outside the tent, the ferry is starting to get into full swing. Thousands of people have arrived for the town's biggest day of the year. The partygoers are blissfully unaware that our mechanics are in a panic. Now they need to lift that trough even higher to get those last precious minutes of sunlight. We've run out of, uh, of lift. The cooking's taking slightly longer. Slightly longer. So if we whip these out, cut them, extend them, put them back in. Right, okay. Gems quickly cut out a new set of supports to get maximum height and catch the last few rays. Keep going, big man. I'm on toes. OK, that'll do. There you go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Now they manoeuvre the whole cooker towards the far corner of the tent. It's their last ray of hope. That's good. The guys are looking drained. But the guests seem happy enough with Dick's choice of sherry. It's going down a treat. But what will they make of the paella? Is it ready? It's as ready as it's going to be. There's no more sun, mate. OK, come on. You Taste ready? it. Well, it's all right if you're hungry. Let's see what he's losing in the mouth. OK, let's get it down. 
It's a tense moment. Jesus has lined up the whole family to pass judgment on the sun-cooked dish. Do you think solar cooking is a good idea? Totally. We are the land of the sunshine, and the paella solar cooking has to be a, a solution here. But I'll tell you something. Maybe if we had a good chef, maybe the paella would be better. <laughs> Do you think we need a new chef? Yes, but I don't like your paella. <laughs> Time for the real test. This man's organized the feria, and he has tasted the paella. I really like it. He wants to know which guy will rise and make it roll. It's been a scorching week of eco engineering for our planet mechanics. They've tasted solar success both at the Finca and now here at the Ferrier, where the revelers are enjoying their very first Andalusian sun cooked paella. Dick and Jem are back with another brand new planet mechanics at the same time next week. After the break, a $2.4 billion gamble in megastructures.